Um, be before I say what I came to say, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart a very big thank you to all of you who run film clubs in your schools and to all of your colleagues who are not here. We have heard loud and clear the message about access and about trips, and we will go back and think about that. But we could not be what we have grown to become without you, and I just want to say thank you. Um, I was uh, 15 and reluctantly in a gallery trying to tune out my parents' hysterical enthusiasm for what they called art when I found myself standing in front of a picture. It had a night scene illuminated only by lamplight, and yet above the darkened street was a bright blue sky with fluffy white clouds. I did not know then who René Magritte was, nor surrealism, nor frankly, very much else. But at that moment, I understood profoundly that there was more than one way of looking at the world. Now I bring this up not because my epiphany with Magritte was a precursor to a glittering academic career. Unfortunately, I left school only months later with a bunch of mediocre O-levels. I bring it up because in that moment, I developed a passion for surrealist art, and it was that passion that led in turn to further passions that included everything from politics to theatre, from ceramics to filmmaking, from history to philosophy, indeed to all the passions that have defined and graced what might have been otherwise an uneducated life. Art resonates powerfully with young people. It articulates what often goes unnoticed or unsaid. It has the power to elicit strong feelings. It can transport them from one reality to another. And it can describe not only what is, but what might be. And if the arts remain the preserve of those who are better off, we are depriving children from poorer backgrounds of one of the core things they need to accelerate their learning, an epiphany. Five years ago, I had a chance conversation with Lindsay Mackey, co-founder of Film Club. She talked of the resistance to reading and the vastly different levels of literacy, the cultural and gender differences that disempowered children she came across in schools. Now, I am a filmmaker by trade, and whilst I could not imagine what Film Club has become, I was convinced that a hundred years of film from all corners of the earth was a pre-packaged resource that could expose children of all ages to a myriad of subjects in a manner that they would accept. Whether it's Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, a marvelous tale of the innocent taking on the corrupt, or Hotel Rwanda, a reality so grotesque to a late teen in the UK that it has ignited outrage fury in film club after film club. Our members increasingly want to know about others and elsewhere. And as the world about them started crashing, they were watching Trading Places, Millions, Kathy Come Home, debating not only how they would run the world differently, but also whether Landis, Boyle and Loach had told the story well. Watching Miracle in Milan or It's a Wonderful Life for the first time is an exciting and enjoyable thing in itself. And as a country whose children came last on the happiness register, we might well feel that that is enough. But at Film Club, we are beginning to record measurable evidence that the watching of films in a group and the subsequent discussions reviewing reaches other key areas in a child's well-being, social development, confidence, and eventually achievement in lessons and exams. Now, it's easy in these times to suggest that schemes such as ours, and there are others that provide music, debating, design, are unnecessary in a system that is striving to deliver core education in an equitable way. Not so. Film Club is our members' window on the world. They sit as a group and without measurement or competition, 
discuss and debate, compare and contrast, and gather the skills and knowledge learnt by osmosis in middle-class homes. It is this learning by stealth that is at the core, not at the periphery, of why some children thrive and others don't. I was once sent a school report in which my daughter's RS teacher had written, Blaze is a wonderfully articulate member of the class who should pay more attention to her spelling in written work. <laughs> However, her grasp on the Palestinian question is astonishing. <laughs> now, I have to tell you, she was in year six at the time. At Film Club, our members show an astonishing grasp of the Second World War. Once they've seen Boy with Striped Pyjamas, Schindler's List, The Pianist, The Counterfeiters, they show an astonishing grasp of metaphor once they've seen Edward Scissorhands in District 9. They show an astonishing appetite for watching and reviewing films about maths, from goodwill hunting to a beautiful mind. Research from Save the Children shows that what happens after the school gate is closed is just as vital as what goes on during the school day. And our children come disproportionately from less privileged families. And we are building an environment where no child is more equal than others. And all children have the benefits of the cultural engagement, discussion and shared experience that is the norm in many privileged homes. With 160,000 children each week in 5,000 schools, our members are watching films that by their own admission they would never have watched elsewhere. Black and white, formally challenging, subtitled documentaries. But their patience and effort is rewarded because they are learning to speak in public, learning to listen, analysing the films they've seen and perhaps most remarkably volunteering to write. There are indications that improvements in grammar, vocabulary and ambition of our members' writing is directly related to their involvement in film club. And in the somewhat reluctant words of one assistant head teacher, some of my boys who are reluctant writers are eager to complete film reviews and do so to such a high quality that I was pleasantly surprised. Arguably, ours is an initiative that is so broad that it does not target the underprivileged. But our breadth is our success. Every child, like every life, needs not one door, but many. And in Film Club, week after week, our members find friends, shared interests, someone to walk home with, a compatible sense of humour or outrage, and something to talk about across the divide of social privilege, gender, academic prowess, and cultural difference. I recently went into a school to do a visit, and I had chosen to Sir With Love, a 1960s black and white film starring Sidney Poitier, about a would-be engineer who could not get a job because of his colour, and who had to teach. What he taught his class about colour, respect and life turns out to be his real life work rather than the building of bridges. It's a film I recommend to many of our clubs, but when I got to the screening and saw that every one of the members was a 15-year-old girl in a headscarf, I was concerned that they would feel my choice too pointed. At the end of the film, there was an interminable silence, and then finally one girl said, Miss, if the world has changed this much in the last 50 years, just imagine how good it is going to be 50 years from now. For me, Magritte turned on the light, and once it was switched on, however meandering the road, whatever the successes and inevitable disappointments, it has never switched off. And in every school I visit, there is a face, whether 5 or 15, whether bright or blank, whether boy or girl, in which I see the light switch on. A child who has understood or felt something they had not understood or felt before. At this time, when choices are being made, it is too easy to turn our back on things outside the curriculum 
too simplistic to love the sciences and kill the arts, too foolish to separate culture from learning. If closing the gap is the aim, then we must give all our children something to think about, something to talk about, something to write about, and a place in which to do it. Then we can watch with pure pleasure as it translates into tangible improvements in attainment. Thank you.